Hey, so let's talk very quickly about why all empires historically have failed. The short answer is that all empires become empires based on military power and then use the military power to project influence. The, what's, what's made the U.S. successful um, has been this actually a similar phenomenon as what made Islam successful, namely the separation of the Medina and the military. By that, I mean the separation of the military from the business sector. The Medina would be the marketplace. Um, so well, anywhere you go, you'll see in, in the Middle East, you'll see a fort, then you'll see minarets. The minarets within the mosques functioned as lookout towers. So, but what you see very clearly is that the business center, the merchants, were very were separate, and in a time before, you know, cars and airplanes, they were separate enough at a distance where you could see that they were not in a position to unduly influence each other. The United States has had a similar situation up to now, where a lot of its inventions have trickled down from military spending into the civilian sector, and then. Over time, uh, you know, the, the private sector has improved upon the innovations of the military, of the military's needs. So almost everything we're looking at today in the U.S. is a trickle-down economy from military spending. But it's been, but it's done, but it's done it that way in an attempt to become sustainable because it hasn't allowed the military direct ownership of the economic sphere. Now, in some countries, they don't bother with that distinction. And surprisingly, a lot of those countries are formerly Muslim countries, like Egypt. The military takes a direct stake in economic, economic projects. They don't have that. They don't bother with a fig leaf. That's important in many ways. So what makes an economy sustainable is the most difficult question to answer for any government. Because the easiest thing in the world to do is simply to borrow money or to, or to try to grow the economy in, in ways that are artificial, but, that, but give you, you know, enough numbers, positive numbers in the short term to get you reelected or to get you positive advertising. And the reason, as I said before, empires that are run de facto by the military, by the military strength, they always fail in almost the same ways. It's because what makes the military successful is in many ways completely separate from what makes an economy successful. Following orders does not make a good society. You need a certain percentage of people who will follow orders once a, once a society becomes large enough to require some form of hierarchy or some form of centralization. But it's nothing, it's not something people instinctively think is a good thing. People instinctively and intuitively realize that, in fact, the ability not to follow orders in certain circumstances is an essential element of civilization, or at least one you would want to live in. In other words, nonconformity is the foundation of a successful civilization. So you have an, an unusual situation where a successful society actually requires some portion of its members who are sworn to follow orders to actually not do so in certain, in certain circumstances. So like everything else in humanity, it's a paradox. And if you want to understand everything about humanity in this civilization, in this timeline, all you have to do is understand that every single thing is a paradox. So the military strength is actually its weakness uh, in, in many ways, because it's got the potential to overwhelm everything else. And this is, explains everything. Look at the Soviet Union. They were the ones that marched into Berlin. And what happened? They were not able to run an economy. They had farming collectives. They couldn't grow enough food. And so you see that even within a centralized system, at some point, nature 
whether it's geographic area or a language or something else, overwhelms human humanity's ability to control the environment, which then leads to, if it's the military, it's still de facto or de jure in charge, which eventually leads to collapse because the military has won, has been successful by essentially defeating through force dissenters, people that don't follow orders. And so once the military succeeds, to the extent that culture is allowed to permeate civil society, it's, uh, again, a situation where the idea has been flipped of civilization, where order has been something that is required, but only in the least well, this is very difficult because it's hard to explain a paradox. So there has to be some order in order to maintain predictability, but not so much so that people become complacent and so on. So again, in every aspect of everything you look at within humanity, all of it sort of gears towards a philosophy of moderation, but also a philosophy that requires the military culture to be separate from civil culture in order for civil culture to grow. With respect to the Soviet Union, the, you know, like I said, if you're not able to, if you're able to win a war by say shooting deserters, um, you know, jailing pacifists, you can see that you're not gonna have, that if you let that philosophy carry over, once there's no specific enemy in sight, what's going to happen is that same philosophy is going to be applied to people within the country, whether it's Trotsky or someone else. And this, this, again, is not unique to the Soviet Union. <laughs> the Catholic Church is famous for this. Um, and you notice that whenever you go to a museum, much of what you see is inspired by Catholic imagery because they were the ones paying for it. And that's one of my biggest laments about trying to understand human history is that so much of it is, is essentially biased. In fact, it's not all of it. Simply because for most of human, humanity's history, uh, humanity has been illiterate. And so, you know, you've got that problem, but to the extent that human beings have been literate, they've been literate only at the behest of a probably corrupt entity, or at least one that didn't start out as corrupt, but became corrupt over time. So when you look at, this has, this pessimistic viewpoint also has optimism within it. Because if you understand that humanity has essentially failed to create a workable system up until now, in exactly the same way on this timeline, in this universe. There's also optimism because it tells you that you're starting from scratch. Your idea can't possibly be any worse than what, what has come before you. As long as you understand that everything that you see and do is a paradox or the result of a paradox. And so like everything else, if you wanna go back to understanding history, modern history, you also have sympathy because you can see that it makes sense to follow the same patterns that made you successful and put you into power. And so on that basis, you can see again why people tend to do things that should fail, uh, that, should, they, that they should know, where well, they should know better, but they don't because they're caught in a system in a particular timeline in their own lives and their own organizational structures that don't tolerate dissent in a way that makes sense or in a way that allows change to meaningful change to flow through enough systems. So the question here is, if you look into the future, you know, you, you, have, you must have sympathy for the people in the past because what's happened is, it's not only a situation where the bigger countries have failed, the empires, the smaller countries have failed. Now I use an example of Islam. The foundation of Islam was basically a prophet that united the Arabian Peninsula and under a system, under a, a system of, of belief in a single deity. So everything is singular, you can't really, deviate from it philosophically. And so you see today the exact opposite 
of what has happened. You see splintering all over the peninsula. If you just look at the continent or the province where Saudi Arabia is based, you see like a Yemen, you see a UAE, you see a Qatar nearby. So what Muhammad has, the Prophet Muhammad has created has within a thousand years, or a little bit longer than that, um, you know, about 1500 years, has been cast away. And so if you're a smaller country, this philosophy still applies to you, even if you think you're awash with money, with sovereign wealth funds, because under the current system of empires, what, you, what really happened is that the empires have found it useful to divide, not necessarily divide and conquer, but create a dependency that is in some ways destructive for everyone involved in a sense of culture, in a sense of debt, in a sense of flexibility, and just being flexible. And this creates problems for everybody as well, because you can also go back in history and see, for example, why if Egypt came under the Roman Empire's ambit, why today it's not successful, it's not a successful country, even though it once was. Because once the empire starts to decline, what happens? All of its satellites that are dependent on either trade with the empire or an exchange of ideas or simply an exchange of currency, all of that essentially causes a worldwide decline. So you can see in some cases why self-sufficiency is a good thing, but you can, you know, within a specific system that respects the paradox of humanity and respects the need to be independent. And the question really is, how do you get there? And if you don't get there, you're going to follow the same patterns. And so we go back into this idea of diplomacy, of how to succeed within an environment where the prevailing wisdom is that the underlying basis of every successful empire thus far has been military might. And people are confused. It's very easy to be confused simply because the system tries to fool you into thinking otherwise. But if you just study why all of the empires have collapsed, it's, it's hard to be fooled. So, the, so the, the task moving forward is how to create, look at what's worked in the past, such as the separation between the Medina and the, and the business area and the religious areas and the military areas and try to figure out a way that these things can be sort of parsed to get the best out of them while recognizing that in some cases the best situations have to be updated and have to be evaluated in, in a way that also indicates the worst. So all these things are, are a difficult task and the you know, diplomacy is essential. And if we're going to live in a society that's something other than might makes right, this is a key question to answer. And it may not happen under the current system of say the United Nations, uh, the current, you know, obviously they haven't been doing a good job if we've been going to war in so many different ways in so many different places. Um, especially because the U UN's mechanism for dispute resolution requires consent between two parties, which obviously disadvantages the smaller or weaker party. And so if you look at this idea of self-sufficiency, that's become vogue uh, in, in, in a context of anti-globalization, you're probably going to look at regional cooperation becoming more and more important and how you proceed within that regional cooperation while attempting to balance empires, one that's declining and one that's rising is going to be key for the future.